A bridge, engulfed in smoke and the aftermath of war. Hues of red dye the skies, whilst the loss of life is shrouded through smog and falling ash. The rift of two cities spawned through an unmerciful class division, with no solution but the result of an ever-growing body count. Arcane establishes unwanted suffering through the literal perspective of Violet and Powder. Nothing left for them but the mocking image of Piltover overlooking their demise, its pristine architecture so taunting in its untouched demeanour. Arcane is a series that flaunts a multitude of compelling character arcs with animation that rightfully boasts in its presentation after years of production. Environmental storytelling, as shown for the show's first sequence, is the lifeblood of Arcane, letting the prop design and background map paintings immerse you in a world that shows, but doesn't tell. Arcane continuously manoeuvres its narrative through nuanced environmental storytelling, where, in a room of cluttered belongings, deliberate lighting guides viewers and powder to the MacGuffin of the story, unveiling a chest containing hex crystals, the dawn of a mystifying power to both build and reckon Piltover and Zorn. The pathetic fallacy of a struggling Jace and his dying mother smothered in the grasp of a storm's temper, soon transported to a field of stillness and beauty. Young Jace experiences the miracle of magic and its potential for others in need, instilling a determined drive which leads him to become the golden boy of Piltover. The first striking usage of that luminescent neon colour scheme, repetitively shown later in the series whilst Jinx's mental health worsens, initially appears during a scene that establishes the only skill Young Powder is seen possessing, this skill being her familiarity with a gun and perfect aim a red herring for the chaos she will invoke ardently as time progresses. A young powder, silhouetted by the damage she caused, an unruly fire ignites the beginnings of the end for Powder, but is a welcoming sight for Silco, a man born in the familiar mist of chaos and death. Too overwhelming for a distraught Vi, who in contrast to a powder framed in fire, is dragged into the dark, not bearing witness to the new dysfunctional match that would soon set Zorn alight. Jinx's signature position in Silco's office, hidden away, perched as she observes his every guest, is paralleled to a similar high-angle shot as seen in Young Vi's and Powder's hideout, messing around during their youth in a time where happiness was minimal, a visual match that teases hope that there is still a part of Jinx clinging on to her past life. And lastly, Mel's recurring painting, a memory of the home she was exiled from, Noxus is a constant thought in her mind, bringing forth the demands of her mother, the cruelty, bloodshed and lack of mercy, a continuous reminder of the horrors her family displays. The immortal bastion forever haunts her ideals of leadership, until the day Mel signifies the freedom and separation she'd always dreamed of, brandishing the painting with a flick of gold and the promise of no return. These are but a few demonstrations of which Arcane's creative team utilises the power of environmental storytelling, giving audiences a tale with no dialogue, crafting upon the world building so subtly to create an immersive and deep threaded story. And we see this predominantly within the disparities of Piltover and Zorn, two cities separated by the discrepancy of inequality towards the standard of living. Piltover is a city of wealth and pride, with a combination of manufacturing, steelwork and advancements that were enhanced by the usage of Hextech. A utopia of grand scale boasting in its progression of becoming a wealthy metropolis hotspot for trade. Its giant white buildings, the demanding visual of the hex gate that towers upon everything, and the large windows taking advantage of the constant natural sunlight, a bitter difference to the poor light and air quality found in Zorn. Its architecture is made to inspire, with majestic roofing and the repetitive banners and crests of wealthy houses, a reminder that Piltover's community lives in prosperity and riches. Detailed railings, beautifully crafted windows, intricate patternings and stone structures, all similar to that of French Gothic and Jugendstil styles. Its iconic slate blue roofs are nod to French Renaissance architecture still seen in northern France. 
with a mixture of decopunk and steampunk that flaunts technological wonders whilst keeping a sleek and streamlined design. Piltover is repetitively shown through wide shots commoderating those beautiful frames of symmetry. Never a sense of disorder or decaying buildings, but a city that stands tall. A symmetrical opening shot with marbled walls, framing the lonely but elegant Mel ostracised from her family, in contrast to the symmetrical viewings of the Kiriman household, their crest shown proudly in gold under a more personal family portrait at the centre. It's foreseeable, through showing the riches and beauty of a city often complemented by the sun, to see those suffering within the pits of Zorn look to Piltover with rage and resentment. Being raised within rebellion and revolt, Vi regards those imposing towers as a provocation for uprising and change. Justice for those deprived and suffering in fear, hunger and crime-infested streets. Not dissimilar to Yuko looking upon Hanaji Academy in Kill the Kill. As every inch, every building, every chase further away from Piltover's vanity-stricken walls wastes away to the appeal of darkness. Natural light becoming a luxury more than normality, only appearing to silhouette the violent outbreaks and produce further shadows in a bleak environment. The familiar blue roofs still found in Piltover, now tainted and aging to rust, are mere remnants of what the Undercity once was. Initially a single community built from ambition and innovation, separated, a severe divergence creating what was once an alliance turned into a relationship tethered by hostility and antagonism. Zorn became a city of neglect. Those same walls and windows seen in Piltover adapted into an Art Nouveau architecture mishap. Its bending walls and oddly shaped handmade constructions a result of rebuilding from leftover scraps. An unconventional restoration from unsecure remains they scourged or left to waste. Corridors and entrances overgrown to the city's abandonment, boxes left, windows broken, confined streets left with no maintenance nor care. Unsecure pipeware connects the lanes, the smells of sewage and waste are regular for its citizens, only highlighted by the neon lights that bring a dying city to life. The Undercity is a place to never see the light of day. Its poverty hides in the shadows, light only filtering its way to the sump, the middle ground of Piltover and Zorn, two populations hovering another incursion, is enough for the smallest of delights for Zornite children. But the most prominent feature of the Undercity is the ever-present smothering of toxic fumes. Whilst Piltover bathes in hues of yellows and oranges, Zorn suffocates in a green smog, but some people adapt to the ominosity the haze creates, blending in and out of the gases that make Zorn its own and benefiting from the horrors it conceals, learning to hide from enforcers and using mist to stay overlooked from none other than topsiders themselves. The locations within Piltover and Zorn embody the reputations of both cities. The last drop works as an artificial beacon of light to those shadowed in the Undercity, a place of community, whether through Vander's leadership or Silco's authority, Zornites gather in need of protection or dealership opportunities. Silco's office within The Last Drop is more refined, acclaiming the class and social status of a tyrannical man prideful of Zorn and its potential of independence from Piltover. His tastes and behaviour are seen through displays of painted portraits, a gramophone speaker and a fancy sofa used to snide at the lowly stool Piltover guests sit on instead. And yet, the inclusion of the large window, the centrepiece of his room, stay similar to the aquarium-like window within his reclusive laboratory years before. An opportunity for escapism, to be an observer of his surroundings, staying astute to his environment. In comparison, Jinx's own hideout is anything but subtle, a mere presentation of the trauma and mental hurt she continues to endure. She lives within a broken turbine complete with neon lights and hanging belongings. The reminders of her failures as seen through puppets of the dead and scribbled drawings, experimenting with further bomb inventions she's able to explode freely and without worry. An antithesis of a topsider's bedroom, decorated with precision for glamour and extravagance, 
rooms that absorb copious amounts of natural lighting and present unnecessary open space. Ironically, the messiest part of Caitlin's room, being a speculative map surrounding a crime investigation in Zorn, are the scattered pages unfit for the refinement of a Kiriman. Caitlin is one of the few characters in the series to venture an experience of living the other city's lifestyle. Arcane perfectly showcases the differing ways of life through the gravitas of characters' interactions with newer environments and scenes of unintentional prejudice. But Victor, having grown in the streets of Zorn and living adulthood in Piltover, bears an inhumane, empathetic story showcasing the consequences of poverty through classism. A boy suffering through the failings of care with an injured leg, he struggles to chase after a mere toy boat. Running frustratingly in want of catching a dream and enjoying the fun a child should experience, he wanders further into the shadows. With a goal in mind, Victor becomes unaware of the darkness he consumes so young, parallel to the unforeseen measures adult Victor takes in trying to heal his dying body. It's only through sacrifice by Hextech augmentation and becoming lesser of a human does Victor create a chance of hope, of running like he never had before, and finally outrunning a proper ship mirroring his toy that ridiculed him long ago. But with a connection to Piltover waning, another's interest in Zorn grows. Vi and Caitlin's dynamic reflects the opposing polarity of Piltover and Zorn, and yet it's Caitlin Kiriman who takes the first step that Zorn and Vi need in actually being heard. So used to green reflections whilst diving into the belly of the beast, that being freed and acknowledged by a topsider is but an alarming change. It's a first attempt at strengthening the bridges that divide those two cities, bridges that mark the divisional wars and battles for freedom, for justice and equal opportunities, to the bridges seen in the depths of Zorn, hovering over Shimmer workshops, a drug consumed to drown out the horrors of a neglected Zorn lifestyle, to the bridge shown within the last sequence of the show, so burnt and broken, barring the hauntings of Milo, Klager and Vander's deaths as Jinx carries the weaponry that would diminish any agreements of peace and unity between Piltover and Zorn. It's this back and forth between a city of fortune and a city of adversity that makes the Firelight's paradise so inspiring, an environment built from the ground of Zorn's failures into a home that is sustainable and habitable, thriving in a place where nature is preserved and blooming, where kids play around freely with lack of fear, and an environment untarnished by smog or sleek architecture. It's what Echo always wanted from Zorn, and is willing to fight for a home where kids like Young Powder can doodle and mess up the walls, but also spare time for the fallen, a shrine of those who persevered through the cruelty of falling victim to elitism and classism. The Firelight's hideout is perhaps the saving grace within Arcane's narrative, and it's only through perfecting environmental storytelling that we're able to truly see the differences between Piltover and Zorn, and the hope of what could lie ahead. As always, thank you for watching. Arcane became an instant favourite of mine, and it was only a matter of time before I covered the series. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I want to thank my patrons as usual for their massive support. I'll catch you guys next time with an anime-focused video.